Hello everyone and welcome to another video in our series Every Chess Move Explained. In this series we are breaking down some of the most famous chess games of all time one move at a time so that everyone but especially beginning and intermediate players can enjoy these fantastic games. Today's game is the immortal game played between Adolf Anderson and Lionel Adalbert Bagration Felix Kaiseritsky. What a delicious mouthful that name is. This game was played in 1851 at the incredible first international tournament in London. However, it was not part of the tournament. It was played after these two players had concluded their match that Anderson won as part of a series of friendly games. Now, in this game, we are going to see Anderson offer a spectacular series of sacrifices. I think that until Kasparov vs. Topolov 1999, this game was likely considered the greatest game of all time, and the complications that are within it have been analyzed by all of the greatest players of all time, and they continue to stagger us today. Anderson kicks the game off with pawn to e4. In the Romantic era, this was the dominant first move. White frees the queen and the bishop, and white will be able to castle more quickly than after other first moves. Black responds in kind with pawn to e5, good for the same reasons, and we get pawn to f4, the king's gambit. The king's gambit sacrifices this pawn here on f4 in the hopes of establishing a strong pawn center here in the middle of the board and really getting a lot of active play for the pieces in return for the sacrifice pawn. Now, Kaiser Ritzky does accept and take the pawn here on f4. In this era, you were considered a coward if you didn't accept an honorably gambited pawn by the opponent. Now, after pawn takes f4 here, we get the move bishop c4, and this allows black an interesting check. More popular is knight to f3 here, which is going to cover the queen check on h4. Instead, after this bishop c4 move, the queen check is possible and Kaiseritsky goes for it. Honestly, this is not necessarily the best choice in the position because the black queen will later end up exposed, which is definitely a theme in this game. Now, after queen to h4 check, you can't block because black's pawn will capture, so you need to move the king and the safest square available is king to f1. After king to f1, black is faced with a choice here. How do you respond and actively develop your pieces? Kaiser Ritzky decides on pawn to b5. This is fascinating and honestly probably not that good. Now pawn to b5 was a bit of a specialty of Kaiser Ritzky, and I think the idea is a good one. The point is to distract and nullify the strong bishop here on c4, and to possibly help develop this bishop here on c8. However, instead of sacrificing the pawn on b5, a better way to do these same things is to sacrifice a pawn with pawn to d5. Now, if this pawn captures, then after bishop to d6, black has got active development with the bishops and this bishop is blunted. And, if the bishop captures instead, then you can develop and gain time on this bishop in a very productive way. And again, you've opened up this bishop right here. So this really makes a lot of sense and is a very popular option in this position. The same ideas as b5, but a much, much better implementation. In any case though, after pawn to b5 here, we do get the capture of the pawn on b5. Both players have gambited a pawn now. This probably works out better for white, although the position is very unclear. Now, there is one other famous game that reached this position. It was between Garry Kasparov, world champion Garry Kasparov, and Nigel Short in an exhibition game played after their world championship match had concluded. Kasparov had black and had to play the b5 sacrifice, and he spent about 15 minutes here basically just thinking about how much he hated his position and how much he did not understand why the pawn had been sacrificed back with b5. Ultimately, whatever the merits of b5 were, both Kasparov and Kaiseritsky decided here on knight to f6, developing this knight and attacking this pawn here 
on e4. Now, after knight to f6, we get a developing move, knight to f3. I told you that the queen that had checked on h4 would later be under attack and white would gain some time, so the queen falls back to h6. The point of this move is to defend this f4 pawn here as white tries to go after the pawn later. The pawn on f4 is both a unit that you want to hold on to and an important kind of thorn in the white side that is creating awkwardness around the white king position and restricting white's pieces. After queen to h6 here, we do get a bit of a passive move from Anderson, very un uncharacteristic of the attacking German player. Now, after pawn to d3 here, you're defending e4, but did you really need to defend the e4 pawn here? Instead, you could have just played d4, establishing the perfect pawn center right here. Instead of this, by the way, uh, short against Kasparov did develop with knight c3. But I like this d4 move because if you capture here with knight takes e4, then queen e2 creates a very unpleasant pin against the king. Now after queen e2, if you try to defend, we can put more pressure on this pin knight, and if the bishop helps defend, then you can play d5, cutting off this bishop. The attack and pressure on the knight on e4 create a very promising attacking position for white. It's a lot of fun to play, and it seems very in Anderson's style. However, after pawn to d3, we still have an interesting game, even though white didn't up the ante as quickly as he could have. After pawn d3, we get the move knight to h5. I tend to think that this move is a bit superficial here. The point of knight to h5 is to possibly take this knight and hop into g3 with check. Knight g3 check will fork the king and the rook, and if you capture the knight, the rook on h1 will be hanging. So this is a significant threat, and black has to, or white has to decide how to respond to this knight h5 move. What turns out to be the strongest move is rook g1. This was not played in the game, but after rook g1, of course, the rook will no longer be hanging here to a potential attack from the queen, and now white can play the move pawn to g4, which will be very strong and will really create problems for this knight here on h5. So this was an excellent, excellent choice that would already have given Anderson a significant advantage and punished the move knight to h5, putting the knight on the edge of the board where it won't be very happy. However, this move was missed, understandable, because this whole thing is very, very complicated, and instead Anderson decided to play knight to h4 here. His point is to hop this knight into f5. However, the knight actually won't be that stable on f5 and won't create many specific threats, so this wasn't the best way to play in the position. After knight to h4, Kaiser Ritzky plays a good move, queen to g5. This creates a very nice double attack here on the loose bishop on b5 and the loose knight here on h4, so we do have a forced response from Anderson. Anderson does play the move knight to f5, saving both the attacked knight and the attacked bishop here on b5. Now, after this move, a strong move for Kaiseritsky was pawn to g6 here, which increases the pressure on the fifth rank as the queen is lined up with the knight and the bishop here on b5. And of course, this is freeing black's position around the king a little bit as the bishop on f8 may have more room to develop. However, instead of that, we get the move pawn to c6. I don't really understand this move, and I think it's actually a significant mistake. Some of the drawbacks of the move are that it's blocking the potential developments of this knight and this bishop, and it's encouraging this bishop, which was undefended and tactically vulnerable on b5, to just pull back to the a4 square where that bishop is going to be so much happier. That's not actually what happened. Instead, though, we get a ramping up of the tension in the position as Anderson just plays pawn to g4 here saying, you're attacking my bishop. I don't care. Instead, I'm just going to attack your knight in response. Now, after pawn to g4 here, we could have seen another attacking move from Kaiseritsky. We could have had pawn to g6 saying, 
I'm attacking your bishop, you're attacking my knight, I still don't care, and I'm just going to attack your other knight, and maybe the game could just continue in a fashion where both players never capture any pieces, and they just keep playing new moves to attack new pieces. Basically, that is the way I see new players, five and six-year-old players play all the time, just keep attacking pieces and never actually capturing any of them. In any case, though, that's not what happens in the game, and we get the move knight to f6. Now, this move seems to be a little bit awkward and a little bit of a mistake. The point is to attack this pawn on g4 and, of course, to retreat the knight from the attacked square on h5, but it does interfere with the queen's potential retreats along this h4 to d8 diagonal, and that queen is starting to feel tactically fairly vulnerable. Now we get an exciting move here from Anderson, rook to g1, which defends the attack pawn on g4, and he is sacrificing that bishop here on b5, saying, go ahead and take it. I am going to try to go after your queen here on the king side if you capture that bishop on b5. Now, capturing the bishop here on b5, which is what happens in the game, is not the correct decision. Instead, black needs to carve out some space on the king side for the queen and the knight that are starting to feel very, very tactically vulnerable. The way to do that is pawn to h5 here, so that after pawn to h4, queen back, pawn to g5, there is a square for this knight to run here on g4, and actually in this position, black is doing okay. Instead, though, we get the capture. C takes b5 here, accepting the sacrifice of the bishop on b5 and saying that I can hold against your aggression against my queen here on the king side. This proves to be a mistake, though. We get pawn to h4, stepping up and attacking the queen. The queen has only one safe square to move to, so she does fall back here to g6. And we get pawn to h5, again, kicking the queen around. The queen has only one square once more. It has to go back to this g5 square. Now, queen to f3 is played from Anderson, and the very, very simple point is that Anderson is threatening bishop takes pawn on f4, and he will finally regain his king's gambit pawn, and he will immediately trap this queen here on g5. The queen has no safe squares to run here. Everything is covered by the knight here on f5, and the pawns, uh, and that queen is just wondering, how am I going to get out of this spot? The answer to that question is that Kaiseritsky plays the move knight to g8. Now, at this point, I can't really suggest anything better, but of course, when you're sitting here on move number 14, and you take the only minor piece you've developed and you put it on the back rank, you cannot be happy. Now, we do have a sacrifice piece. We want a piece on b5, but when all our pieces are sitting on the back rank, we have to expect that our opponent is going to have good options when we're sticking our developed pieces back on that first row. After knight g8, of course, we get bishop takes f4, regaining the pawn and attacking the queen. And that queen now falls back to the f6 square that was freed by the retreat of the knight. And the queen is attacking this pawn here on b2. Anderson has a simple response to this attack on the pawn on b2. He develops his final minor piece, the knight here. It jumps to c3, and of course, not only is it happy on c3, it is thinking about going to d5 or b5 when it's going to create threats of a bunch of very delicious forks. After knight c3, black plays bishop c5. This bishop is hoping that the threat to the rook on g1 is a strong threat, so it's developing with a gain of tempo, but Anderson's not going to worry about this rook here on g1 at all. He's really going to scorn his rooks in this game. So he strikes out. He plays knight to d5 here, attacking the queen and also eyeing this juicy c7 square where he can potentially fork the king and the rook. So with the queen under attack, Kaiseritsky doesn't have a lot of choices. He goes ahead and captures this pawn here on b2. And at this point, both of Anderson's rooks are under attack. Well, what are you going to do when both of your rooks are under attack? Anderson's answer is, well, I'm going to sacrifice both of them. You can have two rooks if you want, and I'm going to play for checkmate. This is thrilling 
and it is why this game is famous, but this may not be the correct decision here. In this position, if you simply save the rook on a1 with the move rook to e1, you have a crushing position here. Again, you're down a piece, but it doesn't really matter, and black is not able to capture the rook here on g1. If bishop takes g1, then white has a very nice winning continuation. Knight to f7 check. The king tries to go over to f8, not to walk into any knight forks. But then the move bishop e5 is a beautiful crusher. After bishop e5, this queen is under attack from the bishop. And now this queen, which was blocked by the bishop, is threatening checkmate here on f7. So you're either winning the queen or giving checkmate. And in either case, you are easily winning the game after that. However, that's not what Anderson played. Instead, Anderson played the amazing move bishop to d6, which is surrounding the black king and threatening all kinds of checkmates with the queen and the minor pieces in this position. So at this point, Kaiser Ritzky can capture both rooks. He can capture on g1, and he can capture on a1, and he can likely capture both of them if he wants to. How is he supposed to do it? Well, the answer, revealed after literal years and years and years of analysis by great players, is that he should capture one rook, not both, just one of the rooks, queen takes a1 check, and after king e2, he can play queen to b2. Now, the queen to b2 move keeps the queen in a defensive posture. So, for example, if you play bishop takes c5 here, the only saving move is queen takes c2 check. You fork the king and the bishop. You're going to capture that bishop, and your queen will just barely be able to hold the dark squares together around your king. In fact, this line, still complicated, of course, is a winning line for black. So Kaiser Ritzky could still have won the game at this very late and exciting phase if he had responded perfectly to Anderson's extreme aggression. Of course, that's not actually what happens in the game. Instead, after the brilliant move bishop d6, he does decide to capture here on g1, picking off this bishop. And of course, the bishop that was on c5 that now captures on g1 is going to be sorely missed as he needs defense of the dark squares around his king. Now, after bishop takes g1, we get another absolutely brilliant move that makes this game famous, pawn to e5. The point of pawn to e5, which is so beautiful, is not to care at all about the defense of this rook, but simply to cut off the queen's defense of the pawn on g7. Anderson is threatening to play knight takes g7 check. If that knight captures on g7, then he's going to be checkmating very, very quickly. It turns out that there is not a defense at this point for black, although you really have to go deep with the analysis here to prove that again. Years and years of analysis by great players has been required to show that black cannot hold in this position. So after pawn to e5, we get queen takes a1 check, picking off uh, that uh, rook here. After queen takes a1 check, the king does step up king e2 in this position. The king is quite safe on e2. And according to Gary Kasparov in his amazing book, My Great Predecessors, in this position, Kaiseritsky actually resigned, not making Anderson show the amazing checkmates. That's kind of crazy to me, but of course, I don't have any source to contradict that. However, in most cases, the finish that we're going to show is given as the finish to the Immortal game. So after King to E2, the main point is that there is a clear refutation of knight to a6, moving this knight and defending the c7 square where white is hoping to land a checkmating blow. The better defense is actually bishop to a6, which is given by a lot of people, but white can still win, win against bishop a6 with the best play. You can play here knight c7 check, 
and then after king d8, you can eliminate this bishop over here. And fantastic grandmasters have shown that if black plays the best move, queen to c3 here, then you can win the queen, and white should have enough attacking pieces here to win the game after capturing the queen here on c7. I know that line was really, really complicated, and I didn't break it down. There are literal pages of analysis you can look at here. If you want to, if you want to see more, please do check the notes uh, in the comments. Uh, there is a further analysis there, but I'm not going to get into the pages of analysis required to show that black cannot defend even with best play in this line. Of course, the main point goes back to king e2 and then knight to a6 trying to defend that knight check on c7. Here white has a brilliant forced mate, knight takes g7 check. We talked about how e5 is designed to cut off the defense of this g7 square. After knight takes g7, the only legal move for the black king is king to d8. You should pause your video here and try to figure out how white can finish off this game. If you decided on queen takes f7, then you will checkmate soon, but you have missed the faster checkmate and you have missed your chance for glory. Instead, in the position after king d8, the winning move is queen to f6 check. The queen is sacrificed, and after the knight captures the queen, you have bishop to e7 check here with a brilliant checkmate with the minor pieces, the knight, the bishop, and the other knight, seal in the black king, and finish the game off. In this game, we have sacrificed that bishop on b5, our queen on f6, and both rooks and multiple pawns to finish the game with our remaining three minor pieces. What a finish this is, and this game deserves its moniker, the Immortal Game, which is first given by Falkbeer. Now, if you like this game and you want to see more amazing games analyzed in this fashion, then simply click on the playlist over here on top of the chessboard. And of course, if you want to support the content, then you can always subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to be notified of future videos.